Hello everyone, Nurse Mark 26 here and today we're going to discuss about vital signs. In this lecture, I'm going to emphasize our nursing responsibility rather than the complex definition of terms. Vital signs, from the word itself, signs, meaning these are objective data, meaning they are measurable. They are measurable by the nurse. The purpose of your vital sign is to monitor the body's function. Now, who can do vital signs? Registered nurse. Registered nurse can do vital signs, but, but assistive personnel can do it as well, provided that the client is stable. When do we do vital signs? It depends on the client's health condition. Health condition. So are they stable or not stable? We can do them hourly in the ward, for hourly even, every 15 minutes in the intensive care unit, every 30 minutes in the emergency room. So it depends on the client's health condition. Now when is a vital signs a must? Upon admission to establish baseline before and after surgery. So before surgery, again, to establish baseline of data and after surgery, why? Especially if the client has undergone general anesthesia because your general anesthesia can bring down all of your vital signs. So it's important to monitor before and after surgery. Before and after giving medications, like your antihypertensive, they can lower down your blood pressure. So it's important to monitor before and after giving medications. Now there, there are four vital signs, namely temperature, pulse rate, blood pressure, and respiration. But I included here as well oxygen saturation. And some institution is recognizing pain as your fifth vital signs. But we're going to discuss pain even further when we go to our medical surgical videos. First one is temperature. The normal temperature is 36 degrees Celsius to 37.5 degrees Celsius. If your temperature is up more than 37.5, that is termed hyperthermia or pyrexia or in layman's term, fever. If the temperature is below 36 degrees Celsius, that is hypothermia. There are five routes for your temperature, namely oral. First one is oral. So take note that oral is the most accessible. Although it is contraindicated during oral surgery and if the client has just had cold or hot food. The rectal route, this is the most accurate. Although it is inconvenient, of course, and the position of the client here should be sideline or seams position. The axillary route over here, that is the safest. And it takes a long time to obtain an accurate result. Now, the tympanic and the temporal, these are your fastest route of temperature. Although in tympanic, the cerumen can affect the reading. And in temporal, the equipment may be expensive. Now, what's our nursing responsibility when it comes to hyperthermia? Fever. Okay, independent nursing action first. Tepid sponge bath. Just take note that the water here needs to be lukewarm. Not too cold or not too warm. Promote rest. Because activity is equal to heat production. And this heat production can further increase the client's temperature. So promote rest. Oral fluid, increase oral fluid intake. Because in fever, or fever by the way is an inflammatory re response of the body, meaning it's a compensatory mechanism of our body when something is wrong. But we'll discuss about fever again in our medical surgical videos. Although in, in fever, there is an increased cellular metabolic demand. 
what this means is that our cells in the body during fever requires more oxygen and water. That's why we have a tendency to be dehydrated. So increase oral fluid intake, 2 to 3 liters per day. Monitor vital signs and inflammatory markers like your WBC. WBC normal range of this one is 4,500 to 10,000 per microliter. WBC. And administer antipyretics. So this is a dependent nursing action. This is a dependent nursing action now. Your paracetamol. Hypothermia, our main responsibility is to provide a warm environment. Offer the client a dry blanket or warm clothes. Dry, warm clothes. Next, let's go to pulse. The normal pulse rate is 60 to 100. If the pulse is high, more than 100, that is tachycardia. And if the pulse is low, lower than 60, that is bradycardia. We assess the pulse for rate, strength, and regularity. So the rate, if it is within 60 to 100, the strength is the pulse bounding, is the pulse weak, if the pulse is bounding, maybe the client is overloaded. If the pulse is weak, maybe the client is dehydrated. So for the regularity of the pulse to assess for dysrhythmia. So there are nine pulse sites all over the body. Radial, brachial, temporal, carotid, apical. Popliteal is behind our knee. Dorsal is pedis and posterior tibial is in your foot. And femoral is in the legs. Now, how do we assess for apical pulse, the point of maximal impulse? We use the stethoscope. And the stethoscope has two sides, the bell and the diaphragm. The diaphragm, we can use that for high pitch sounds. So your heart sounds, your breathing sounds. This is what we use to assess for your S1 and S2, the lab dub. The, the bell of the diaphragm is used for low pitch sounds like your heart murmurs, your S4 and S3. Now what I want to emphasize here in the section of pulse is the medication digoxin because we encounter this medication a lot in our practice. Digoxin, brand name Lanoxin, is a cardiac glycoside. It is mainly used for clients who have AFib, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. Cardiac glycoside means it will increase heart contractility. This means it will increase the pumping action of the heart. And at the same time, it will decrease the heart rate to lower the cardiac workload. The normal therapeutic of your digoxin is 0.5 to 2 nanograms per microliter. This is the therapeutic level. If it is more than this one, that is digoxin toxicity. What happens in digoxin toxicity is visual changes first. So blurred or yellow vision. Then we got GI symptoms, which is anorexia, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, followed by initial fatigue and weakness. Do not, repeat, do not give digoxin if the heart rate is lower than 60. So if the heart rate is lower than 60, do not give. Take the pulse or the heart rate after an hour. And then after an hour, if it is still lower than 60, we notify the, sub the prescriber. Monitor electrolyte level because increased calcium, decreased potassium, and decreased magnesium predisposes the dioxin toxicity. Meaning, meaning before we start the patient on the dioxin therapy, we need to monitor the electrolyte levels first. And as much as possible, as much as possible, do not give the dioxin before meals. Because I mean, do not give the dioxin with food. Because what will happen is that it will delay 
absorption. If possible, it should be 2 hours before and after food. So I hope that's clear. It's time to copy. Now, let's go to respiration. In respiration, our normal volume is 12 to 20 if you are an adult. If this one is increased more than 20, the term is tachypnea. Lower than 12, the term is bradypnea. Apnea is the cessation of breathing. Zero breathing, none, like in your cardiac arrest. For respiration, we assess for the rate. If, it's, if it is within 12 to 20, the volume, if the patient is hyperventilating or hypoventilating. Hyperventilating is deep, rapid breathing, and hypoventilating, hypoventilation is the opposite shallow respirations. Okay, nursing responsibility. Hyperventilation, what do we do? We calm the patient down. How do we do that? We can use the first sleep breathing technique. So in first sleep breathing technique, inhale for two seconds through the nose. So you come for two seconds, inhale. And then we exhale through pursed breathing. It's like blowing through a candle. Okay? And in hypoventilation, we can have the client have incentive spirometer because this will expand the lung. We will discuss this one even further when we go to our instruments and laboratory values. We assess for effort. It's the client dyspnea or having orthopnea. Dyspnea is the difficulty of breathing. Is the client using respiratory accessory muscles even more? Is there an increase in nasal flaring? So dyspnea. Orthopnea, this is the condition when the client can just breathe easily when they are upright, when they are sitting down, when they are standing. So they cannot breathe normally when they are in a supine position. So I hope that's clear. Let's move on to blood pressure. Blood pressure, the normal systolic is lower than 120 and the normal diastolic is lower than 80. You are considered hypertension stage 1 if the systolic is 130 to 139 and the diastolic is 80 to 89. Hypertension stage 2, the systolic is greater than 140 and the diastolic is lower than 90. Now there are a few factors that affects blood pressure. As a nurse, we need to know this. First one is age. <clears throat> As we grow older, our blood vessels become rigid. It's not flexible as it used to be. And if it is rigid, there is a more tendency for the blood pressure to go up. Okay, increase in age, increase in blood pressure. Stress and exercise. What will this trigger? The sympathetic nervous system, SNS. What will that cause? Vasoconstriction. What will vasoconstriction cause? High blood pressure. Medication, your antihypertensives, they can lower down your blood pressure. Obesity, uh, an excess in fat deposits in the blood vessel can lead to increased blood pressure. Temperature, extremely cold environment will lead to vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction will increase the blood pressure. Extremely hot environment will cause vasodilation. Vasodilation can cause decreased blood pressure. Take note of that. Nursing responsibility. Common errors when taking your blood pressure. The cuff is too narrow or the cuff is too wide. Now, the cuff, the position of the cuff, if this is the brachial pulse, it should be one inch above the brachial pulse. That should be the position of your blood pressure cuff. And when you put the cuff in, you should be able to insert two fingers in there, at least two. If the cuff is too narrow, it is false high. If it's too wide, it is false low. 
if the arm is above heart level, that is false low. And if the arm is below heart level, that is false high. Now let's go to the last, which is oxygen saturation. Oxygen saturation, our normal here is 95% to 100%, except, except for patients who have COPD, their normal is 88 to 92%. 70% is considered life-threatening, a medical emergency. How do we measure oxygen saturation? Okay, by the use of pulse oximeter. Now, nursing responsibility here in pulse oximeter it's a small uh, clip-like machine that where you insert your finger. That is the pulse oximeter. Avoid too much light exposure. So if there's too much light, maybe dim the light or put blanket on top of the finger. Avoid nail polished finger. The machine, the pulse oximeter won't be able to have an accurate reading if you have a nail polished finger. So use other fingers or we can use a nail polish remover. Avoid too cold fingers because if the finger is too cold, it means that the perfusion in that area is not good. That's why you will have an inaccurate reading. Avoid excessive hand movement. Parkinson's. They go like that. So what? Is it possible to use the finger pulse oximeter here? Maybe, maybe, but if it's not possible, we use the earlobe pulse oximeter. Okay? So that concludes our discussion. I hope you learned something. In the next video, we'll have roles of nurses and the levels of prevention. That's all for now. I hope you learned something. Nurse Mark 26 signing up.